Greetings, friends, and happy Father's Day, and welcome to the third edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. I'm Paul, and I'm here with my son, co-host, and partner in the paranormal, Benjamin. Hey, how's it going? Our theme today is Witness to the Afterlife. Now, I guess you could call it a very appropriate Father's Day theme because we'll feature the greatest father-son afterlife connection case that I've seen in 38 years of paranormal research. And then in the second half of the hour, we'll look at another case with some other pretty spectacular family-oriented phenomena, you might say. But before we welcome our first guest, I think we deserve a little bit of a comment on what happened on last week's show because maybe it's kind of too cool to let pass without a mention. Now, if you were listening last week, you noticed that we lost the audio uplink to the studio twice during the show. Now, we broadcast from our home in New England, and the studio was in Phoenix, but unless you're buying the gas, then distance doesn't mean that much anymore. None of us could really figure out what was wrong. Now, after two hours or so after we went off the air, Ben came barreling down the stairs to my office, and I'll let him take it from there. Well, it was a Sunday evening, about maybe... 10, 10.30, hmm. I was sitting in my bed, just staring out the window at the sky. All of a sudden, I keep seeing, I kept seeing these weird lights popping up all over the place. And I was looking, and I was just like, all right, I, I, I don't believe what I'm seeing. I kept looking, and I was finally like, you know what? I'm just going to go tell my dad what I'm seeing, because I just don't believe it for myself. So ran down the stairs. I was like, Dad, quick, come upstairs. There's this crazy UFO thing going on outside. And he was like, all right, sure. We went in our attic. We were looking at the skylights, looking like he couldn't see anything for a couple minutes. But then he finally saw what I was talking about, although we don't really know what it was. It could have been ball, lightning, like it was hot, humid, all that stuff. So I let my dad take over. Well, it was very interesting. We have a steeple here in one socket, Rhode Island, the town we live in. And uh, the steeple is always lit at night. And we live kind of up on a hill, and our skylights get a pretty good 180 of the whole Blackstone Valley. And this this thing is always lit. And there was there were several of these small lights, Bennett pointed out. It took me a minute to see them. But uh, I was reminded of orbs or ball lightning or something of this kind. And one of them went, went whipping around the steeple, and the lights went out. And Ben had reported the lights had gone out previously. And wouldn't you know that the next day, I was talking to someone from that, uh, from that vicinity that we could see, and uh, she said that the lights had gone out twice and that someone in her neighborhood had reported uh, strange uh, uh, lights um, in the sky at that point. So uh, I think that um, if we all thought what we thought we saw, what we thought we saw, our technical glitches last week might just possibly have had a paranormal explanation. So how appropriate can you get? Uh, anyway, I just thought we'd begin with that, and, uh, and we, would, uh, we would proceed from there. But I wanted to share with you that maybe it was uh, quite, a, quite an interesting experience last week. And how appropriate that on Father's Day, uh, we welcome today's first guest. Dave Kane has been a well-known talk show host in New England for many years, and he is the father of Nikki O'Neill, the youngest victim of the February 03 nightclub fire in Rhode Island, which you certainly heard about on the news, that claimed the lives of 100 people. The unmistakable, ongoing contact between Nikki and not just Dave, but the whole family and friends, based on the number 41, formed the basis of Dave's great book, 41 Signs of Hope which the Boston Phoenix newspaper called a miraculous little book. Hi, Dave. Are you on with us? Hi, guys. I sure am. Thank you so much for inviting me on. Well, welcome to Behind no the problem. Paranormal. Oh, I'm thrilled. This is like I get to be on radio. <laughs> well, Dave, as I say, Dave is a talk show host himself. He's just being a wise guy right now. Anyway, Dave, uh, thanks again for being on. And uh, would you just, uh, all I could, the best question I can think of is just to ask you to tell the story as it, as it happened from the day of the fire. Um, uh, don't leave out the cell phone incident and, and just uh, kind of get us going here. Well, there's a, yeah, it is a wonderful present to be asked to be on for Father's Day and to celebrate my, my being Nikki's dad. Uh, Nikki, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Paul and Ben, uh, Nikki was uh, 18 years of age. He was the youngest victim of the Station Nightclub fire. Um, Nicky, before he passed, had a thing for the number 41. Uh, he'd get in the car with me and say, Dad, look, it's 241. Or he'd, he'd see a license plate and say, Dad, look, 41, 41. And we never knew what specifically this was about. He didn't even know why this number. 
Well, when the day came for the fire um, and Nikki passed, he was 18 years and 23 days, 41. The um, station nightclub is at latitude 41.41. The fire call box at the station is 4414. And on the cover of the book is a sketch that our friend Charlie Hall, an artist, did for us of a video of a picture of Nikki from a videotape we found a year after he passed. And uh, he's about four months old. His mom is holding him. And he's wearing a baseball uniform. And the number on the cap is 41. And uh, after he passed, we have had a myriad, and I mean a whole truckload of signs and messages from Nick, many around the number 41, but not all of them. And that's where the book comes from, and that's where my story begins. What really strikes uh, strikes me, and, and, and in the beginning it did too, was that it's not just you experiencing these things. It's pretty much the whole family, right? Oh, yeah. There are friends. There are uh, acquaintances. There are family members. There are friends of Nikki, people who never knew Nikki, that after listening to me on the air talk about it, they'll get some things that are kind of astounding. Uh, we've been to several mediums, and uh, they've been able to uh, give us amazing stories, all, again, around this, the terrific ability of Nikki to, to contact us. Now, I know, Paul, you talked about the cell phone you wanted me to, to tell about. Um, yes. It, it, Nikki, Nikki passed on a Thursday. The station nightclub fire was on a Thursday. Uh, and, uh, however, we uh, did not have any contact about his remains for four days. We were waiting to hear back from the state because there was 100 people that died in this fire, 200 more that were injured. It was, it was an absolute calamity. It was, by the way, the fourth largest nightclub fire in American history. And on Monday following the fire, uh, I, I had, in the meantime, been answering all of the phones, my wife's cell phone, my cell phone, the house phone, talking to a lot of, because I've been on the air so long, a lot of my media friends called for information. And uh, on Monday following the fire, I got a call on Joanne's phone, uh, cell phone, and when I looked at it, it said it was Nikki. So immediately I took the call, and, and, and I, was, I didn't know what was going on, and there was nobody there. Now, your mind begins to race, as you can imagine, Paul. I'm thinking to myself, oh, gee, maybe he's not really passed. Maybe there's a confusion. Maybe, maybe he has amnesia. He got hit in the head. He's someplace else. We didn't know what to think, so I called uh, the cell phone company, explained the situation. They put a couple of supervisors on it, and they found out that the phone had been turned on at 10 minutes to 12 and turned back off and then turned on again at 10 minutes to 3 when I got the call and turned back off. So I figured that it was the rescue workers who had found the, you know, the, the phone and were messing with it to find out whose it, whose it is. And um, then um, that night we got the call that they had found his remains, and I had to go do the paperwork, etc. Two days later, I went to the uh, funeral home and got the only remains that we had from him, uh, physical um, material, was his cell phone. And we found out that the cell phone wasn't working. Uh, it had been uh, destroyed because of the water damage. So that this cell phone could not have called me. Uh, it had to be Nikki calling us to let us know that our ordeal was over. That's absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, just to uh, remind people, you're listening to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno on Achieve Radio. Our guest is Dave Kane, New England talk show host, and as we call him, Afterlife Witness. Uh, if anyone has questions for Dave, you're welcome to call in. Uh, it's toll-free in the U.S. and Canada, 888-235-7374. Uh, you can also instant message, uh, but don't ask me how to do it because I have a different screen than you have. Anyway, uh, Dave, uh, people in the family began to experience things, and people uh, who were friends of the family as well. And I must uh, share with people th that uh, I, I have known you for a while now, and you approached me about publishing uh, your book because my family, and I always regret saying this because after I do, every novel jockey in the country comes out wants me to publish their book. But my family's in the book business. Uh, we own New River Press, which sponsors this show. And uh, I, I began to have things happening to me relative to the number 41. 
As a matter of fact, when, when we edited the book, uh, our editor, uh, Sue, uh, called us and said, you're not going to believe this. This book has come out to 41 chapters. So I, <laughs> yeah, I, I immediately to... called you and, and your lovely lovely wife, Joanne, and I, you, you said, the, what, the lights flickered or something at the time? Well, we have, we have a light in the den that whenever uh, Nick is around, uh, the light will flash. Uh, now, of course, people listening, as you know, Paul, there's a lot of skeptics. And, but um, when we are in the den, periodically the light will go on at just the right moment. We had Robert Brown, the international medium, in that den one night, and he started to talk about Nikki, and suddenly the, the light started to flicker. Well, the night that you called, uh, Joanne answered the phone, and you, you said to her, uh, she told me, you said to her, you know, uh, you're going to think I did this on purpose, you're going to think, I, but I promise you it's that I didn't, but the book has come out to 41 chapters. And I heard Joanne say, oh, that's wonderful. And at that moment, the light in the den started flickering like crazy. And uh, that's when we found out it was 41 chapters. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, there's something else that uh, tied into the book, too. If you remember, Paul, the only – I was thrilled that New River Press was going to publish the book. I had wanted this out and I had been working on it, and it wasn't easy to find a publisher who had any interest in this book at all, by the way. Um, but when I found you, the only stipulation I said, I absolutely have to get it out in time for the anniversary of the fire, which was February, um, excuse me, uh, yeah, February 20th. And you said, that's fine, we'll do what we can. And then when the book was just about ready to come out, you, um, I went on Amazon, and it said, 41 Signs of Hope will be available as of January 28th. And that thrilled me because January 28th is Nikki's birthday. And yeah, we had no idea. You had no, you didn't know that, no. And I know nope. that certainly the people, you know, Amazon didn't know it. And it, so this was another sign to us that Nikki was part of this and making it happen. Well, there is an amazing photograph uh, that you uh brought forth, which was, uh, I guess you're in a hotel room, and uh, so the number 41 comes up in, in various things, but also in this photograph, Nikki himself seems to appear. Well, and, uh, yeah, that's exactly, exactly it, and again, this is, uh, I guess, when we do the new rendition, or the new edition, excuse me, of 41 Science of Hope, we're going to try to get one on as soon as we can. We're, we're adding so many stories because they don't stop. They continue. This is not a... Here's a story, and here's the end. This, they go on constantly. And uh, we went up to New Hampshire for Thanksgiving two years after Nikki passed. And we were all in a hotel room and a bunch of family members. And um, I was laying down on a bed, and Joanne was standing up. And in the picture be, behind her is a picture of um, – well, st excuse me, standing behind her is a figure that has a turtleneck on. You can see the fabric on the turtleneck. You can see a sh two shoulders, one on one side, one on the other. You can see a leg at the bottom, uh, a black leg. And it's all, it is absolutely Nikki's build and Nikki's height, but you can't see his face because Joanne's head is in front of his face. And there was nobody standing behind Joanne when that picture was taken that we could see. But he certainly <laughs> showed up in the, in the picture. It is quite remarkable. As a matter of fact, with your permission, I'm going to show it uh, during our webinar. Ben and I are having a webinar uh, Thursday, June 19th, and there's oh, yeah, still a few great. places for it. You know, and yeah. uh, it's, it's entitled, strangely enough, Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. And yeah. if you go to pauleno.org, uh, look for the uh, webinars with Paul link. You can, can uh, find out some more information about that. But uh, tell us about Disney World. Well, Disney World, you know... Um, Nikki loved Disney. Every year we went to Disney World and we'd enjoy it. We'd take the whole family for a week. And just, it was just his favorite place in the whole world. And uh, so the January after he passed, we all went to Disney World to celebrate Nick. And several things happened. Uh, when we arrived, we had arranged to have a limo pick us up. And the limo picked us up, but it was late getting there, which uh, timed out so that when we crossed the threshold of Disney World, it was 741. Um, the first night that we were there, everything went well, no problem. The second night we were in the same room, the alarm clock in the room went off at 441. <laughs> no, we hadn't <laughs> used it if we hadn't said it. And Nikki especially liked hoop de doo Review. And uh, I should point out that Nikki's favorite 41 was 941. I don't know why, but it was. 
So we're going over to Hoopty Doo Review this night. We're on the boat going over the island, and and my wife said, uh, just as we were getting to the dock, she said, okay, Nick, here we go, Hoopty Doo Review. And as soon as she said that, every light on the dock went out and came back on. When we got to the ticket window, she gave her re- receipt for a reservation, and they gave us our ticket with the table number on it, and the table number was 41. There were nine of us in the party, making it 941. And when Joanne came over to us, excited to tell us exactly what had happened, she said, look what table number we got, 41. And as soon as she said that, a little boy with blonde hair, which Nikki had, ran by us, and his mother yelled out, Nicholas! <laughs> you got to so, love it. You just got to love it. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, it doesn't Wait. stop. It's unbelievable. Now, now, we've had several. Now, I don't know what you... What else you'd like to know? But we, we've had several medium encounters, and the first one was with Cindy Gillen. Yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, wh- wh- when did you first go to mediums about this? Well, a medium came to me about it, actually. It was, it was the day after the fire. Uh, Cindy Gilman, who is a Rhode Island medium from Rhode Island, a very accomplished medium, I had had her on my radio show several times as a guest, and, you know, she would do readings for people, etc., Well, the day after the fire, she called me and left me a message and said, I heard about what happened. If there's anything I can do, please let me know. Now, I didn't know what she was talking about because we hadn't publicized about Nikki yet. We hadn't told anybody. So I called her and realized as I was talking to her that, that, you know, she didn't know. And she was talking about the fire. And I said, well, you didn't know about Nick. And I told her about Nick. And she said to me, Oh, I should have said something. Now, for all the skeptics in your audience, um, I my first thought was, oh, great. Now this person is going to try to make believe that she knew what I just told her. And I was kind of irritated, and I terminated the phone call. I wasn't very pleasant to her. And then a couple of days later, after I had kind of settled in a little bit, I called her back to apologize. And she said, no, no, you need to know this story. And she had stayed up most of the night. If you remember, Paul, this, this, this fire was broadcast all night long on local television. I'll never forget and, it. Huh? I'll never forget it. Yeah. And she, um, she was watching it most of the night. She finally fell asleep. Next morning, she got up she, about 8.30. She sat at her kitchen table, made herself a cup of tea, and she got a, a vision of what she described to me as a charred boy. And the young man said to her, please call my father, please call my father. Well, she didn't know what this was about, and so she just went to her personal phone book and flipped it open, and she flipped it open to the page on which my name was the only name on the two pages. And she said, gee, I'll go on Dave Kane's show, and I'll, I'll talk to him about this, and maybe we'll find out who this boy is. She never realized it was Nick. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, now, Ben has a question he's been uh, waiting to ask you as well. Oh, great. Yeah, have you, yeah, have you had any had new, like, 41 events that have happened to you, like, recently or whatever? Yeah, we've had, a, we've had some several. Uh, as a matter of fact, we had one really interesting. Again, it happens to, to go with, um, with mediums, Ben. Uh, you know of Maureen Hancock, who we speak about in the book. She's another medium that we visited. And uh, <laughs> recently, Joanne went to see her by herself. And Joanne is next mom. And, and at the end of the session, Maureen said to Joanne, do you have any questions? And Joanne said, yeah, what does Nikki do all day? <laughs> you know, and we were kind of chuckling. Um, and she said that Nikki helps young people pass over. She, he helps young people to make the transition. And he holds almost like a class. He teaches them how to communicate with their family. Well, she stopped in the middle of this speaking and she said to Joanne there's a young man around Nikki right now who passed in an impact and Joanne thought that it was Nick's friend Eric who had passed away six months earlier in a car accident and Maureen said no I know about Eric this is another young man his name is Ryan or Brian and he died in an impact and there's a butterfly story around him So Joanne didn't know what this was, and she came home. In the meantime, I was in my office working, and I got an email from a woman, Paul, who had just bought my book, One More Sale, Paul. uh, I'll be plugging it in a minute. Don't worry. (laughs) She had just just, uh, bought the book, and she wrote to me and said, I just ordered your book. She said, I can't wait to get it. She said, because my son, Ryan, 
passed in an automobile accident two and a half years ago, and I have a wonderful story to tell you about a butterfly tied to Ryan. Now, I got that story as Joanne was getting the story from Maureen Hancock. So I, I asked this woman to contact me, and she did. Her name is Sue. And she told me that, that this medium, this other medium, whose name is Lisa Powers, told her to get my book uh, and, and said that it, was, that it was Nikki that told her to tell, told her to, to see that she got it. So, of course, I got a hold of Lisa Powers. I don't know her. She's never met me. She said, your son, she said, I bought your book. I haven't read it yet. I had not read it yet. She said, and your son came to me and told me that I had to make sure that I got this book to one of my clients, but I didn't know which one it was going to be. And, and Nikki said, you'll know. And, well, the, the woman came and left, and she didn't know. And after the woman left, Nikki again appeared to her and said, listen, you got to get this book to this woman. So she wow. did. And, and the next morning or two days after, she was – she woke up at 4.41 in the morning by Nikki, and Nikki said, so when are you going to read my book? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the woman got up and read it right then. It's and, amazing. Uh, so, so, yeah, so this is, this is showing us exactly how he does what he does. Exactly. Well, the book, folks, uh, 41 Signs of Hope by Dave Kane. It's in our little commercial on our show here, but go to 41signsofhope.com or amazon.com, and the author is Dave Kane. And uh, you're listening to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno on Achieve Radio. Uh, now, Dave, also, now, now I always have to put my two cents in here because, you of know. Of course. You know, now, I've always been wary of, of mediums. As a matter of fact, I've made fun of mediums for the past 40 years or so. Now, not all. Not all. And I've learned a lot over the past few years. As a matter of fact, I've been working with a few of them. Uh, Sherry Devereaux, uh, who hosts a show here on Achieve Radio. And you know Sherry because she was visiting yes. Rhode Island. She was on your show. Yeah. And uh, I've, I've just, the reason I was skeptical is because you don't know where the information is coming from. And everything that, that they receive, they believe. And I think that's a mistake. However, that being said, this particular case uh, has been so overwhelming, and I have run into these from time to time in my own career. Uh, one of them was a, with a five-year-old child who died of leukemia, and that's in my book, Turning Home. And the power of these people, the, these uh, souls, whatever, I mean, it's, it's just amazing. Now, I used to laugh at stuff like, you know, Nikki being in a classroom teaching somebody, because, you know, you're talking about the, uh, uh, the other side, quote-unquote, and all this. But when you look at my own theories that there is no death, not even for the body, and that people are, uh, go on thriving in, in parallel universes where in some of them they can still uh, love and be loved by their families, certainly, and, and, and interact in some way, uh, that, then Nikki could be in a classroom teaching, and I can just imagine it with, with someone of his power uh, sharing what is good and sharing knowledge. Uh, I think that that's, that's a wonderful way to look at, uh, a very simple way, but a wonderful way to look at what's happening in the multiverse. And you asked several times how certain things happened. Uh, there was one uh, incident that I explained in the multiverse manner, so to speak, uh, with you um, uh, having something appear in front of you on the sidewalk. Oh, yeah, this is, this is an astounding story. Um, do you want me to tell it now? Uh, yeah, we're, we're going to be coming up on a break, but I think uh, if you could hold on past the break. We okay. have a second guest, but that could be our final. Uh, yep. um, okay. Let's see. Well, yeah, yeah, just very briefly. Oh, well, well, I, I mean, I can hold it. They can, they, you know, that's fine. I just, I didn't want to interrupt your train of thought. I didn't know what you were, but, but it is true that these things happen unbelievably. We had, um, Joanne was walking one morning very early, 6.30, all by herself in the neighborhood, and she was talking to Nick. We lived in a house that they had made a clubhouse in the attic, and they painted all kinds of things on the walls and on the ceiling, and they had cartoons, and they signed the walls and everything. And uh, we, we left the house, had to leave the house to, for another reason. And Nikki was very sad uh, leaving that house. And so as Joanne was walking. She was saying to him, someday I'm going to get that house back, and I'm going to get everybody back to redo the, the attic and to draw all the drawings and sign them again. And then she said to Nick, of course, I know I can't get everybody back. And she stopped, and she looked down, and there was a piece of art paper on the ground. 6.30 in the morning, dewy morning, she picks up a very dry piece of art paper. She turns it over, and on the picture, on it was drawn from a young hand, a man, a woman, a boy, and a dog, and it was signed by the artist, Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> and That's amazing. That, we have it. It blew me away. Uh, and you started to explain with this multiverse concept and how it could actually have been placed there. 
So it, it, it's stuff that I don't understand, Paul. All I know is that it's, it's going on. Exactly. Well, what matters is that the love is there. And we talk about the boundaries of the mo- or membranes, as some physicists actually say, between these worlds. And uh, they're real worlds. They're physical worlds, and uh, we're one of them, you know. And it's very, very – I've seen it lots of times. People interact across these boundaries, when, especially when love is there. And our next guest will, will talk about some of that in her own family. Uh, but anyway, I think we're going to uh, have to take a break here now. Uh, I want to um, just remind folks that uh, – Dave Kane's book is available on Amazon or uh, at 41signsofhope.com. And we want to, uh, to thank uh, Dave for being with us. And definitely, Dave, we're going to continue this uh, at some, in some future show. This is just oh, fascinating stuff, and it's like That'd it never ends. Thanks so much for okay. both of you guys. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate it, and, and I'll talk to you guys soon. And Great remember, do not fear to hope. That's right. Okay, folks, it's time for our break, but we'll be back shortly with a case in which 225 years' worth of the same family seem to be living together happily in a Connecticut farmhouse. is proud to sponsor tonight's segment of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Benjamin Eno. New River Press offers the best in unusual New Age books. Stand by the side of tonight's host, Paul Eno, as he battles poltergeists and helps suffering souls and families in the critically acclaimed books Faces at the Window and Footsteps in the Attic. Plunge deeper into the paranormal with Paul and learn about his influence on human history, its action in our daily lives, and its ultimate meaning for us in the best-selling Turning Home, God, Ghosts, and Human Destiny. Available now from New River Press, publishers of unusual books. Visit NewRiverPress.com, Amazon.com, or your favorite bookstore. And set for release late this year in one of the most unusual books on the subject ever written, Paul gives us Dancing Past the Graveyard, What Ghosts Have to Say About God. When you open your mind, you can hear with your soul, all your heart can be whole. Spirit Connections is a weekly journey investigating and sharing spiritual topics. We'll help you become aware of how the spiritual worlds connect with us all daily and how to safely access that guidance. Each week, a variety of guests will share how they connect to spirit and enlighten us with their insights. Experts in all areas of spirituality will share their wisdom, as well as what's new in the media pertaining to spiritual consciousness. Now is the time to find your inner spiritual strength. Let us offer logical answers to your questions into the unknown. Knowledge is power and the way to find your own spirit connection. is proud to sponsor today's segment of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Benjamin Eno. We offer the best in unusual New Age books, along with three great books by your host, Paul Eno. New River Press offers the new blockbuster on animal communication, Hear All Creatures, The Journey of an Animal Communicator by Karen Anderson, and Experience 41 Signs of Hope, the inspiring book by Dave Kane. And don't miss Shadows on My Shift, real-life stories of a psychic ENT by psychic medium Sherry Lee Devereaux. Achieve Radio Talk Show host of Opening Your Intuitive Eyes. Available from New River Press, publishers of unusual books. Visit NewRiverPress.com, Amazon.com, or your favorite bookstore. to a 
AchieveRadio.com, the positive side of broadcasting. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. This is our second uh, second half of the second half hour, I suppose. Unfortunately, I just heard from our producer that our guest, uh, Donna from Connecticut, with her amazing case, uh, will not be able to be with us today because she had a traffic accident. To thank God, nothing serious, but enough to keep her off the air. So we'll try to get her for next week, and uh, we don't want you to miss that, that wonderful case. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the meantime, we have plenty of other things to do here. Uh, we have a, a message here from Bailey from Massachusetts. And speaking of messages, before we... I don't want to forget this. I want to thank all of you who have written in uh, all the uh, the wonderful uh, congratulations and, and the things you've said about the show, even though this is only our third show, we really appreciate that you're listening and that you do uh, like what we're presenting so far. Uh, we always welcome your comments. Uh, you can contact us through the Paul Eno, P-A-U-L-E-N-O dot O-R-G website at any time. And uh, there have been uh, a number of emails today that I received, and yes, that was me on the History Channel this morning uh, on the, the series The States, and uh, they show that the immortality through reruns, I suppose, no multiverse, multiverse or not, uh, that... that yeah, exactly. That seems to be something that, that you can achieve immortality through. Anyway, there is uh, Bailey from Massachusetts here has written in, uh, I listened to your show last week. Interesting. I can agree that this universe has many levels of consciousness or life above and below our material level, and spirits come and go in the, those levels as allowed or able. It seems reasonable that spirits could come and go or birth and rebirth as desired or required. Now, actually, last week's show uh, was about reincarnation, and we had Dr. Susan Martinez uh, aboard with us. And uh, again, my, as those of you who know me or have read what I've written know that, that my point of view is a little different, or sometimes a lot different on some of these things. The whole notion of spirits, uh, I just, hmm, and again, this is perhaps 12, 10 years of seminary talking, but I, I have... A problem with some of the interpretations and some of the terms we use. Uh, I was talking to Dave Kane about mediums and, and why I'm a little bit wary of some of the approaches that, that some of them take. And the whole notion of spirits in the multiverse is a little slippery. Spirits means uh, essentially means something that is a discarnate entity, an entity with no material body. And there must be universes where certainly where mit- matter, as we understand it, perhaps doesn't exist or exists in some other form. But spirits, as such, are not the are, are not the the be all and end all outside of this particular universe. In my opinion, I think that when people die, uh, which they I don't believe they actually do. Uh, their bodies are existing as well in many of these universes, and it's all us. Now, we're going to get into that in other shows, but uh, I cer- certainly thank Bailey for writing in, and I think you sort of get the idea here. I might put it in a little bit different terms, but there are different levels of consciousness. The notion of your higher self and all this stuff is you in a universe where, in my opinion, you have more enlightenment, you have uh, more wisdom, and you can perhaps reach out and help even yourself in this current universe where our consciousness happens to be. Because remember, it's all you, and it's all part of your subconscious, all these lives. So you can be your own guardian angel, in a sense. So there we are. I'm going to uh, get into a few other cases here. We have been following several cases. Uh, One is from Liz in uh, North Carolina. I haven't heard from Liz this week, but we have uh, discussed electrical phenomena off and on uh, on the show, and we certainly were talking about our show last week where we might have had possible uh, UFO incident that, that disrupted our signal. But we have uh, Liz in North Carolina, who is one of many people who has experienced exploding light fixtures, uh, electrical phenomena being caused possibly by something that may be paranormal. So we had advised her to go to an electrician and have the house checked out and the wiring just to make sure that it's not something of that nature before we move on to something that, uh, that we think uh, could, be, could be paranormal. Now, I want to remind you, you're welcome to call in. Our number is 888 888- Two three five seven three seven four. That's toll free in the U.S. and Canada. And Ben and I are here to take your calls in the uh, unfortunate absence of, our, absence of our guest, and we'll try to entertain you as best we can. That's what we're here for. <laughs> exactly. And uh, do you want to do this or should I? Go for it. Okay. All you. We've been talking about paranormal news of the world for the last two shows, but we haven't had a chance to do it. And we're going to try uh, try one here. Now this is from the British newspaper The Telegraph. And a, uh, the 
The headline says, a ghostly apparition of a young girl is being blamed for a series of crashes on a stretch of country road. Paranormal researchers are investigating the sightings of a girl in Victorian dress on a road in the West Midlands, that's of course in England, which locals say is an accident black spot. The late night visions are believed to have been responsible for a number of crashes and near misses in the area in recent years. Investigators looking for a logical explanation, whatever that may mean, for the mystery admit they are baffled. David Taylor, chairman of the paranormal of the Paris Search Group, said he received reports that the apparition had been the cause of several accidents. Although the people who, quote, although the people who have reported the sightings didn't actually crash, they were close to it because they had to swerve around the apparition and up onto the pavement, unquote, he said. The area around, another quote, the area around there is an accident black spot, and there have been some serious incidents, so maybe they have seen the same thing. There could be a logical explanation for this. It could be an optical illusion of some sort. For 22 years, we have been running a group who investigate claims of the paranormal. Most of the time, there was a logical explanation. There's that term again. But so far, I haven't found one for this case. The image had been des described as a small girl between the ages of three and five years old and wearing Victorian clothes. We are trying to find out any stories locals might have of the area, which might explain who or what this could be. And there's a bit more to this. But we run into this sort of thing frequently. And there are apparitions of this kind that may or may not be true. Uh, this one, I have no doubt, uh, uh, really uh, has been reported by many people, and certainly people are seeing something. Now, in the multiverse concept, you've got people from other, other universes who are interacting with our own and whom you can see across the membranes of these things. Now, I always ask the question, and I mentioned this in the first show, why, do, why are ghosts seen frequently, anyway, in clothes? Uh, carrying worldly objects, uh, acting as though they would in, in life. Uh, how come they don't know they're dead? Well, as I said in our first show, they don't know they're dead because they're not dead. Our huge subconscious, the, the, the subconscious mind that we all have, is made up, in my opinion, in my experience, over 38 years of looking at this stuff, as, as lives we are living in parallel universes. And you can, again, it's all you. It's all possible to have contact across these membranes and to, uh, and to have um, perhaps guidance or, or things that are negative uh, that, that could happen. This particular young girl in Victorian garb is probably going about her day in perhaps 1870 or 1880, in my opinion. Again, I haven't looked at this case personally, but that would be my first reaction if it is a legitimate paranormal case. And when people are driving along... I think she may be very sensitive. I think the more psychic you are, the more likely you are to be a ghost, so to speak. This particular girl may be very aware of machines that she can't understand, perhaps going by her, perhaps she can't see them. Although, in my experience, these ghosts, quote-unquote, see us as we see them very often. And we have uh, a situation here where that might just uh, certainly be the case. Now, you talk about logical explanation. You know, this gets into the whole notion of, of, of why ghost hunters ghost hunt and why the whole uh, effort to woo scientists is, is useless, in my opinion. Now, for many, many years, I was, and I was one of the, I guess, the first modern ghost hunters starting in the early 70s. And there was a great movement at that time among psychologists, uh, physicists, who, uh, the very few who were interested in this subject, to try and gather data that would prove to mainstream science that the paranormal was real. And there are still people out there doing that. I'll often meet young ghost hunters and I'll ask them, why do you do this? Well, we're trying to gather data. Uh, so that they go out and buy all this incredible equipment that, you know, such as uh, electromagnetic field meters, ion detectors and things that really don't they, they really, in my opinion, don't see, the ones I've met anyway, don't seem to understand very well. And that don't seem to mean much in the end, in my humble opinion. And we were doing stuff like this in the, in the medieval technology that we had in the 70s. And they're using a lot of photography and this sort of thing. And I came to the conclusion that it's, it's pointless. It really is pointless. There's nothing any of us can do to prove anything to modern science. Why? because of human nature. For those, to who, uh, for those who are true believers, no proof is necessary. For those who are not believers, no proof is enough. There is nothing we can do to prove anything to mainstream science. And I don't think that's a problem, because we are the weirdos of philosophical history. 
we're the ones who are odd in not believing. Everybody just about before us, and there were always exceptions among certain philosophers or scientists, throughout history since at least the last Ice Age have believed in God, have believed in the paranormal. And I always say the paranormal is the mother of both science and religion. There would be no science and religion in their current forms if it weren't for the paranormal. If we didn't ask experience, we didn't ask why we were experiencing the unexplained. If we didn't see that figure standing in the dark who looked just like grandma, if we didn't have feelings of knowing something beyond ourselves, I think that might, that, that might have meant that we wouldn't have had religion or science as we understand it. So science and religion are siblings, really. And why they fight, maybe it's because they're siblings. I don't know. But in any case, that's my opinion of logical explanations. One man's logic is another person's foolishness, I suppose. So I long ago gave up trying to prove anything to anybody about this. And so that's my opinion on that. Now, uh, we have uh, one or two other cases that we were working here as well. Um, and I wanted to uh, speak with uh, Donna today in Connecticut to get some updates on her case. But basically, this was one of Ben's first cases. And we experienced what we believe were the multiverse uh, in, in this particular house. And as a matter of fact, Donna contacted us in 05 because she believed that we were... Um, that she was experiencing the multiverse because she had just read my book, Footsteps in the Attic, which was the first book to go into really these theories in any depth. And essentially you had a house, a farmhouse built in 1783, in which you now, to, at this point, have six generations living. And uh, we would always joke, and it wasn't a joke apparently, that you had all six generations still living in this house uh, rather peacefully. And she did, and I'll let, and hopefully we'll get around next week, And I'll, although we have another guest next week, too. We'll, we'll work it all in. I know we have a lot to do on this show. But Donna was explaining that very recently uh, she would come down uh, with uh, her, I guess it's her granddaughter, because I think her son and daughter live, daughter-in-law live in the house with them. Now it's a big house. And she came down to find a, a toy tractor with pedals uh, pedaling itself around the living room floor. Now, when Ben and I were there, you could just feel uh, uh, the presence of many, many of these people. As a matter of fact, I was sitting, I don't know if you remember this, Ben, you, you were sitting at the table as well. And uh, I think we both commented that we, we felt someone walk behind us. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And one of the reasons, uh, just to digress a bit, why I got Ben involved in this, and my, my wife and I were very concerned about whether we should, and there are still cases I won't let him participate in because they're pretty much negative things from the multiverse that I don't want to have anything to do with just yet, uh, was because I thought that I wondered if, if blood relatives have the same physical and psychic reactions to situations like this as people who are not related. And we started with cousin, uh, cousin Marshall from uh, Connecticut when we went to visit a, a library that had paranormal uh, water appearing on the stairs, and, and that's, another, that's a story for another day. Maybe we'll have Marshall on to talk about that. But then I moved on to Ben uh, once we thought we should do this. And uh, he, in this house in Connecticut, was probably one of the first cases where he uh, really and I felt the same, same kind of things. We'll be walking around an area, and we always check the outside of a house as well. A lot of people don't do that. And we'll uh, pick up the same, uh, the same feelings, really, at the same time. But, but among the things that happened in this house... Uh, were that uh, people would, would feel each other's presence. They would feel the presence of ancestors walking by or, or, or being in the room with them. And it all seemed very amicable, really. One of the things that I may have mentioned before, but which struck us, was when Donna was describing, remember we were sitting in the living room there, we were describing, she was describing legs hanging from the ceiling of the living room when the family was sitting around in the living room. And these legs would be walking as though it was a normal day in the life of, you know, someone, someone else. And they were walking on a surface that they couldn't see in our particular world, in our particular universe. Uh, there was another incident that, that I felt that I picked up uh, outside the house near the front stone wall where I believe there had been an accident. Uh, someone had fallen off a horse and, and either been seriously injured or, or killed. That was very obvious as well. But the family, uh, when you mention these things, knew pretty much what we were, were talking about. And Donna described it pretty much as multiverse uh, experiences here. And there was much more that happened in the case. And we'll let hopefully Donna fill you in uh, once she is uh, able to uh, be on with us. Now, I wanted to catch you up here on some of our events. Uh, as we try to do every week. Uh, we've been trying to do online events because gas being what it is, it's an absolute nightmare, and we wanted to uh, 
to uh, share with you some events that you can do right from your own home. Participate with us either on the phone or on the computer or both. And we had uh, learned how to communicate with animals with Karen Anderson. These are all New River Press authors uh, who are friends of mine and uh, have written terrific books. Karen is an animal communicator. She lives in Washington State, and her event we've been talking about for Tuesday, June 17th, has been sold out. However, she has rescheduled it for the 14th of July, which is a Monday, and I believe it's, uh, you can get full information at uh, start at paulino.org, P-A-U-L-E-N-O dot O-R-G, and look for the webinar link on the left, and you can go to all the different ones that are now available. Uh, ben and I have one coming up this coming Thursday, uh, June 19th. It's a webinar, 9 p.m., to 11 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. Pacific Time. And now on the 26th of June, we have Other Sides, Learning to Use Your Psychic or Multiverse Power with Yours Truly. Uh, That's 9 to 11 as well, Eastern, and 6 to 8 Pacific, and everything in between. Now, I wanted to mention something I haven't had a chance to mention in past shows, and this is the support group that we are starting for people who believe they are the victims of parasites. Now, parasites, as I have described before, are negative entities, non-human entities that live in the multiverse. And they have access to us to, uh, in lack of a better term, feed upon us. Now, you ask yourself, what is the origin of the original, what, what the original stories of vampires? And you talk about vampires in ancient Middle East and ancient China. They're not talking about these guys with fangs and wearing capes and, and uh, European noblemen. The actual translation from the ancient Babylonian is life-sucking ghosts. And early on in my career, and as early as the late 70s, I said, this is what I'm running into in a lot of these cases that are negative, such as the Bridgeport poltergeist outbreak of 74, which we talked about in our first show. And there are people who do seem to have problems with these things, and as a matter of fact, whole families can. And I found that there are occasionally incidents, which we used to describe in the seminary as, as possession or demonic oppression, they're two different things, but that's how we used to talk about them. And they can indeed occur, and that's one of the reasons I was working in psychiatric hospitals as a grad student was to kind of check out things like this. So we have uh, several cases right now of people who are having problems of this kind, some of them stemming from cults, some of them stemming from use of Ouija boards, things of this kind. And I'd like to form a support group, which would be telephone-based, Uh, that would help people simply by telling them that they're not alone. Because the whole message of the multiverse, in my opinion, and the whole message of the paranormal, which is the key to the multiverse, is that we're not alone, is that we don't have anything to be afraid of as long as we stick together, and that we are never alone, even if we have no one physically with us. We always do. And this is the idea of of this group, and it's a simple approach. We're not going to do any any ceremonies or anything or exorcisms or anything of this kind. We're just going to be together. Even if it's over the telephone, you don't have to give your name. Uh, However, I do want to check out the story before we take any further steps. So I would ask you, if you do believe that you are having a problem or your family is having a problem with uh, an entity that is negative or some, something of this kind that is just r- kind of interfering with your life uh, to a serious degree, then uh, I'd like you to email me through the website, paulino.org, P-A-U-L-E-N-O dot O-R-G, and we'll take it from there. Now, I can't guarantee you're going to get into the group, but I would like to find out about the case, ask you some questions about it, and see if, it's, if it warrants uh, further action of this, of this kind. So I... Okay, now I'm going to ask here that um, we uh, look at another case as well. I ask you to consider what I just said, and we'll move on to one more case. I think we have time to read uh, before the uh, end of the show here. Uh, This is one I started last week but didn't have a chance to finish, especially with all our technical glitches. I live in a one. This is from Carol in Montclair, New Jersey. I live in a 100-year-old house. A few years ago, my sister-in-law said that she felt something try to choke her in our guest room as she was resting. I thought she was nuts. One year ago, I saw a smoky shadow, kept its shape but had no definite form, inside my room that passed in front of the window. After it passed, the window, it turned into a brilliant white spark, which flew around the room and then disappeared. Another night, I woke in the middle of the night, just able to, not able to breathe. I was not having a nightmare and was not frightened when I woke up. I just did not have air in my lungs and had to fight to draw breath. 
I did not connect it to anything at the time, so none of us, none of this troubled me terribly, and I told no one in my family. However, a few nights ago, something happened which frightened my 14-year-old son so badly he refuses to go into his bedroom anymore. He had a dream in which he opened a door in our basement. When he opened the door, he said he woke up and saw a blue flash in his room. When he turned his head to see what the flash was, he saw a leering, pale, green, floating figure with holes instead of mouth, eyes, black hair, very high cheekbones, with a very pointy chin. Wide awake now, he says, he saw a second blue flash, but he did not, he did did know if the maybe did not know if the figure was still there as he refused to look or look a second time. He said he lay there in terror for hours until morning. I would normally dismiss this as a bad dream, but I don't know what to think anymore. Should I be worried? Please help. Well, certainly try. I always uh, notice that a lot of these things take place on the verge of sleep, okay, or just coming out of sleep. Now there is a certain state, and I don't want to get into sleep studies here, but when you're between waking and, and sleeping, that we all know, I think, is really a very psychic time, for lack of a better term. So that, but that does not mean that we are not having a legitimate experience. I would need to ask more about this, of course, to, to see if it really is paranormal. But it does have a lot of the characteristics that we do encounter in negative cases where these parasites may be involved. Oh, I understand what you're saying because something like that happened to me. Like whenever I like wake up, I'm like almost like falling asleep. I hear like voices talking to me and stuff. I know I'm not crazy. I just hear like people's voices like saying my name, just like over and over again and all that. Well, I know you're not crazy, too, but you're, yeah. you're very psychic, and that's only just starting to develop with you. And uh, as, we, as we begin, uh, whether it be with Ben or with any of you who will want to participate in our uh, uh, Learning to Use Your Psychic Power seminar on the 26th, then we, we're going to talk about how to start to control it and this sort of thing. Uh, but I often find that, and I'm glad you brought that up, Ben, because I often find that people will call us into these houses, and they will be just very psychic people. And they're just picking up these multiverse realities that are around us all the time that a lot of people don't pick up. And their house isn't haunted as such, but it may be uh, they're, they're just seeing past the, uh, the boundaries of the, of the universe is more than other people can. Now, what I'm going to do over the next week is I'm going to contact Carol here in Montclair in New Jersey, and I'm going to see uh, if we can find out some more about this. And if we can't get her, perhaps come on the show and tell us what, what may have happened in the meantime uh, and to look into some of these things. I'm a little concerned with the idea of the smoky shadow, okay, uh, which uh, was reported here has kept its shape and had no definite form. And I'm also uh, interested in the fact that not just one person is seeing these things. One of the first questions I ask in a case, we ask in a case, is who else is seeing these things? And here we have not only the lady, but she's reporting that her 14-year-old uh, son is also uh, uh, seeing this as, as well. So we're going to look in, into this further. And uh, we have some lots of messages here. Unfortunately, we haven't had a chance to, uh, to get through uh, David in New Mexico has just written in, and I'll just read it very quickly. I'd like to make a distinction between science and scientists. Science will accept anything with sufficient evidence. All too many scientists won't accept anything that disagrees with their own current theory. And I'll tell you, David, if you've paid 100 grand for, for a degree, you wouldn't agree with it either if it disagrees with what you learned. As Arthur Clarke said, sometimes the only way to get a new theory accepted is to wait for that generation of science scientists to die off. Yeah, Max Planck, the great German physicist, said the same thing. Uh, ideas are accepted not because people come to accept them, but because their opponents die and uh, the people who grew up with the ideas came, uh, came forward and, and accepted them. David, thank you for that excellent thought. You've given us our thought for the day. And may I th thank you again for, for coming uh, to hear us as, as you have been, I hope, for the last few weeks. Next week we will have as our guest, Dierlan, author of Heaven's Wave, a new book about the Mayan doomsday prophecy of 2012. And uh, 2012 will be our theme. And if it's true, hey, why worry? I'll leave you with the thought, may all that is good, holy, right, and true be yours until we meet again. Thank Thanks you very for listening. much. Thanks for listening. New River Press is proud to sponsor tonight's segment of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Benjamin Eno. New River Press offers the best in unusual New Age books. Stand by the side of tonight's host, Paul Eno, as he battles poltergeists and helps suffering souls and families in the critically acclaimed books, Faces at the Window and Footsteps in the Attic.
plunge deeper into the paranormal with Paul and learn about his influence on human history, its action in our daily lives, and its ultimate meaning for us in the best-selling Turning Home, God, Ghosts, and Human Destiny. Available now from New River Press, publishers of unusual books. Visit NewRiverPress.com, Amazon.com, or your favorite bookstore. And set for release late this year in one of the most unusual books on the subject ever written, Paul gives us Dancing Past the Graveyard, What Ghosts Have to Say About God. When you open your mind, you can hear with your soul. All your heart can be whole. Spirit Connections is a weekly journey investigating and sharing spiritual topics. We'll help you become aware of how the spiritual worlds connect with us all daily and how to safely access that guidance. Each week, a variety of guests will share how they connect to spirit and enlighten us with their insights. Experts in all areas of spirituality will share their wisdom, as well as what's new in the media pertaining to spiritual consciousness. Now is the time to find your inner spiritual strength. Let us offer logical answers to your questions into the unknown. Knowledge is power and the way to find your own spirit connection. Will you always come? 